perfect. Oh no, he's having the mal test. Okay, we are 17 so far. I'm actually quite glad to share that some of the startups that I've been working with in the last few months are joining us. They are students from Imperial College, by the way, Nigel. <laughs> we have quite a global representation from Mexico to India. So truly global and diverse. So I would say for the training, Are we able to hear people as they join? Because I don't know whether you can yes, uh, to mute. Yeah, yeah probably they unmuted themselves. So probably I will, uh, mm, let me check if I can manage that from here. We've got a fresh trim and everything. Okay, looks like most of our guests are actually muting themselves. I think you might just need to tell people, remind them to go on mute if they are. Yes, we'll do, we'll do, yes. Uh, yeah, that's a very good suggestion. The slideshow needs to just go back on again. And then yeah, yeah, because uh, every time I yeah, get I the controls. <laughs> of course. The recording is on. All right. So I would say, let's uh, make a start. And uh, well, good evening and a very warm welcome to Energy Transition to Net Zero. Uh, I am uh, Rosario Di Dio. I'm the founder of the Tech London Advocates Circular Economy Group, and I'm your host today. Uh, a few quick words for those who are joining us for the first time today. Uh, the Tech London Advocates uh, is an independent, non-for-profit network of private sector and public sector tech leaders, experts, and investors. We are more than 13,000 volunteers who promote London as a global tech hub and address the challenges facing tech companies in the UK. Uh, there are about 50 working groups focused on uh, the growth of a specific uh, tech vertical. In this case, for example, uh, our group, uh, Climate and Sustainability Tech. Tech London Advocates is part of uh, the Global Tech Advocates Network, a group of 25 networks representing the world's fastest growing tech city and uh, regions. Advocates can unite from around the world to focus on specific trends and challenges. I'm delighted to have such a prestigious set of speakers and moderators today and to welcome such a wide, diverse and global audience. Uh, hope you may find this discussion informative and thought provoking. First of all, a couple of uh, housekeeping details. Uh, the event, as you might have heard, is being recorded and I would kindly ask all attendees to mute themselves uh, so that we don't have echo as we speak. Thank you. And uh, yes, um, uh, feel free uh, if you're not comfortable in being shown in the recording to block your camera and to uh, delete your name on your screw, um, uh, screen on Zoom if you wish so. 
then regarding comments, feel free to feed comments and questions in the chat. Uh, we will have a Q&A question uh, session at the end. I will be overseeing that flow and always worth reminding that uh, while all views are welcome to stimulate a discussion, uh, we trust that that is going to be constructive and fact um, I suppose with that kind of thing, it's really useful always to get additional marketing contacts for the accelerator as well, because if they like... Excuse whatever, me, I've got a, a, a participant who's being heard. Can I ask everyone again to mute? There you go. Thank you. So, uh, yes, uh, now let's get into the context of our topic today. Uh, energy transition to net zero, research and investment in hydrogen, but really also in technology such as energy storage and fuel cells. Uh, now, uh, to set the stage really for our panelists and for our moderators, uh, the uh, net zero is a means to an end, the Paris goals, which is uh, uh, meeting the uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius global warming target. Uh, to do that, global carbon emissions should reach net zero around mid-century. Energy is responsible for almost 75% of those emissions. Uh, that makes the energy transition a critical part of the race to net zero. So uh, hydrogen, energy storage, fuel cells are becoming front and center of this uh, transition process and that debate. So we are here today because the global tech advocates wish to spread awareness on these topics, to facilitate the collaboration between research, industry and finance, and to speed that transition process. So this is why I'm delighted to have today uh, with us, uh, Stefano Bezzato, who's head of European Utilities Research at uh, Credit Suisse, uh, we have uh, Professor Nigel Brandon, who is Dean, Faculty of Engineering and Professor of Sustainable Development uh, in Energy at Imperial College. Uh, then I'd like to welcome uh, Jan Lozek, who is the founding and managing partner uh, at the Future Energy Ventures. He's also a partner of uh, TLA. Uh, as moderators, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Parvez Khan, uh, who is uh, uh, Global Vice President, Market and Human Insight, uh, and uh, Non-Executive Director, and one of the top uh, UK women in data and technology. And then last but not least, uh, I'd like to welcome as a uh, second moderator, uh, Russ Show, our founder and leader uh, of both Tech London Advocates and uh, Global Tech uh, Advocates. Before we open the panel, I'd like to ask uh, uh, Russ, to uh, give us a, a show, brief address on the Tech for Net Zero campaign that is leading across the global network uh, as we speak. So, Ras, please. Thank you, Rosario. No, thanks so much. And, and hello, everyone. Great to have you joining us. Um, we've got some terrific speakers and, and moderators lined up for the next hour. Um, Global Tech Advocates, as Rosario mentioned, is, is a global community of leaders all coming together in a voluntary capacity to support startups and scale-ups in their respective tech ecosystems. Uh, we now have 25 groups in the Global Tech Advocates community. Last week, we launched two new groups, Tech Berlin Advocates and Tech Florida Advocates. And next week, we're launching our first group in the Middle East, Tech UAE Advocates, with groups launching um, in Africa later this year. So the network keeps growing and expanding. It was around this time last year that we kicked off our Tech for Net Zero campaign to prepare our community for COP26, which took place in November. Last June, we held an investor showcase with our European groups uh, talking about why they're investing in Tech for Net Zero and why it's so critically important. And people like Jan Lozek from Future Energy Ventures joined us for that. Um, I can see that we have Gary Bernstein who heads up Tech Scotland Advocates on this call. He hosted an event um, at COP26 in Glasgow, really focusing on younger people and getting younger people engaged in what we're doing on Tech for Net Zero. Many, if not all of the GTA groups around the world are actively promoting Tech for Net Zero through their respective groups. Um, I'm also delighted, and I sometimes chuckle at this, that we are now 
featured, Global Tech Advocates is featured in the Coldplay World Tour app. They've got about 10 different partners to support their sustainability tour, and they really like the work that we were doing on Tech for Net Zero. So uh, download the app, as they say, and check out what we've got in there on Tech for Net Zero. The last thing I'll say is we do have a Tech for Net Zero resource hub on the Global Tech Advocates website. Within that is a startup showcase that showcases many startups and scale-ups from around the world, focusing on net zero and sustainability. So do take a look. And with, with that, Rosario, I'm going to hand back to you. I know I'm going to moderate the second session here. So uh, I look forward to this first one uh, with Parvis moderating. Thank you very much, uh, Russ. And uh, obviously, we hope we can have a follow-up with uh, all the attendees today to join us in the, this campaign. We'll touch on that uh, uh, later. So uh, now, time to really enter the discussion. So uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Parvis Khan. Uh, Parvis, thank you so much for joining us. And really, over to you to open the discussion on the energy transition to net zero. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Rosario. Well, you know, I spent a lot of my time doing research with young people at schools, colleges, and universities across the world. And what I know from my research is this, the future sustainability of our planet is top of mind with millennials and with the Gen Z generation. And whilst they often see themselves as agents of change and need to take their own actions to support our collective efforts, they still expect governments and institutions and businesses to take that driving seat when it comes to this change. So sticking to the theme of driving change, I'm gonna kick off this discussion with a panel on where are we now today with the transition from fossil fuels to clean energy and re renewable technologies. So what is the current state of play? We've got about 10 minutes, so super short. So we're gonna keep this pretty succinct. And I wanna start the discussion with Professor Brandon. Now, Professor Brandon, your area of expertise lay with electrochemical technologies, which include hydrogen, fossil cells, and energy storage. From a science and a research perspective, where are we today um, with these technologies? So I'm gonna just start with Professor Brandon. Okay, well, th thanks for the question. Um, I mean, it's perhaps, make a few kind of three or four comments really about um about research and innovation and its role in the low carbon transition um whether that's electrochemical technologies or other um so i mean just to note that i've been involved in um developing and scaling up these technologies all of my career since i completed my my phd so both in industry and academia and i've helped found four technology businesses in in this space um, I guess I would perhaps make three three comments, right? One is um, we are in a, in a fairly challenging race against time. Um, if an innovation currently sits in an academic research lab, such as my own, it, it's very likely that it will be 10 to 20 years before it actually makes an impact at scale. So one of the things we need to remember is that we have to get on with using the technologies that we have and the technologies that are coming along uh, and not just wait for something better before we do, before we act. Of course, research and innovation will drive improvements. It will make things cheaper. It will make them last longer. And there will be many benefits from so doing. But we mustn't make um, best the enemy of better in that sense. So that, that's one thing to say. Um, secondly, I think the commitment to net zero that we now have, and I've been in this area a long time, really has moved the dial in terms of our ambition uh, and, and also brought into play a range of different technologies, and I'm sure we'll talk about them, but hydrogen is one of the technologies that has come more strongly to the fore as part of a solution um, when we have uh, a net zero rather than an 80%, say, cut in, in carbon emissions as our ambition. So it, it does change, change the dial there. And finally, my last comment, and I'm sure other panelists will speak to this, is that we are dealing with an energy system we're not dealing with a set of, I mean, there are within that a set of distinct technologies, but actually what matters <coughs> really is how the components within a system work together, um, whether it's heat power or, or fuel or transport fuels, cross-sector coupling is therefore more important, 
uh, and indeed how that system works with end users and consumers of those energy services is also very important. So whilst I sit at one end of that innovation chain, uh, actually the whole innovation chain is very important um, in terms of actually moving the dial here. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank, thank you for, for that. So research, innovation, development are key drivers of change, but of course, one of the other key drivers of change are those utility companies. And whilst we've seen examples, and I'm sure we, we, we all know about these examples where companies are investing in renewables, we also know there are many companies that appear very wedded to conventional fossil fuel activities still. So, so on that, I'd like to turn to Stefano. Your work at Credit, Credit Suisse involves researching the large utility companies. So can you tell us a little bit about you know, what you think of the, from that work, the main trends, some of the opportunities, but also the challenges that these companies have been facing in their efforts to reduce their carbon emission and mitigate the effects of climate change? So over to you, Stefano. Uh, thank you very much, Parvis, and, uh, and thank you to the team for, for having me today. Um, look, I mean, I think the first thing I would, I would like to point out is that we are already seeing uh, the utility companies that we do research on uh, involved in a, in a shift in investment driven by uh, this process of energy transition. If we step back and go back to 2009, 2010, these utilities, challenge number one, faced a major leverage issues. They cut investments, they increased efficiencies uh, throughout 2009, 2013 to, um, to, to deal with this, uh, uh, with this unfavorable position they found themselves in. Um, after that, we have seen a significant pickup in investments for most of the utilities starting from 2013, 2014, uh, driven initially by renewables. Renewables is not the only part of the story here, but is what, in my view, is kicking off this uh, pickup in investments for, for the sector. So just to give you a couple of numbers, 2013, the utilities we're doing research on invested 40 billion euros uh, across Europe. Uh, of that 40 billion euros, it was equally split between maintenance and development capex. Uh, move, uh, roll forward to 2022, we currently forecasting the same group of utilities to invest around 80 billion euros. 30 pretty much unchanged in maintenance, 50 is development. So we're seeing progress there. Renewables, and here I would like to uh, touch on, on three key drivers of this trend. Renewable is clearly the first driver. Doing a very quick history, we saw utilities initially listing these businesses, spinning off these businesses. You remember 2009, 2011, we had a number of IPOs of renewable subsidiaries. They were quickly uh, bought them back uh, around 2012, 2013 from these utilities, and that kicked off a process of scaling up. So today, the largest renewable developer globally is adding six gigawatt of capacity globally per year in 2022. Uh, you go back uh, four or five years ago, I cannot think of anyone that was adding more than one per year. So we have seen some scaling up. Um, second point that I find, the second driver is, is the role of networks. So all that kind of infrastructure that uh, our utilities are, are managing is that is uh, also important in the energy transition. That's being a bit overlooked by the investors I speak to as my clients, especially until a couple of years ago. But if we think about it, there is a study from Euroelectric, the Association of European Power Distributor, that is indicating that by 2030, the sector needs to invest 400 billion euros for power distribution only. Um, if you think about that 400 billion euros, many times I speak to investors, they tell me, oh, that's EV charging points, and we're not sure that uh, penetration of electric vehicles will be enough to uh, sustain that kind of investments. Well, actually, EV charging points is less than 5% of that number. Quarter of that number is modernization of existing grids. 
uh, another quarter is around smart meters so and 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 adding new renew connecting new renewable capacity so there is a big need of investments that we started seeing utilities picking up on and here again to give you a couple of numbers in some research analyst 20 billion of investments on the grid uh, in Europe in 2015 has become 30 billion in 2022. And the last point, uh, and then I leave it to the rest of the panel, um, another challenge slash driver is what to do with the gas infrastructure and thinking of gas networks that for some of the utilities is an important, as being an important part of the business. I think investors we speak to have assumed that those are assets with a sell by date, the, with a much shorter life of uh, compared to the power networks. I think when it comes to hydrogen, which uh, uh, Professor Brandon brought up as a topic, uh, hydrogen could give a new lease of life to those uh, assets and, and be supported by that part of the, uh, of the business as well. I, I finish with a quote from uh, uh, the CEO of Angie that reported results uh, Q1 results this morning, and she was uh, discussing about the energy context in the current geopolitical situation. And she basically said, we are at an inflection point to unlock the potential of renewable gases. So for me, three drivers, renewables, grids, uh, renewable gases. Thank you. I mean, this theme of innovation is a recurring, recurring one, isn't it? Um, and we, I'd like to unpick that. We know we're going to do that a little bit more with, with Russ's um, session. But I want to stick to some of the trends that we're seeing in innovation and, and ask about the kind of innovation that is really needed to support this transition to net zero. And I want to turn to Jan and you founded a specialist venture capital firm focused on this very area. So can you tell us a little bit, Jan, about the kind of investment trends that you've seen already? Stefano has sort of picked up a bit on this already, but maybe you can elaborate a little bit more about some of the sort of investments you're seeing in this type of innovation. And as usual, you're on mute. <laughs> There's always uh, somebody. <laughs> we're kidding before the session. Now, now I fall into the trap. Sorry for that. Hi, everyone. I'm Jan, founding and managing partner of Future Energy Ventures. And, and, and just I'm coming with a totally different perspective to the, to the, to the topic. Um, um, but it's building on what Nigel and Stefano has, have said. If you think about how the energy infrastructure hardware mini is developing, the established ones, I'm not talking now about fuel cells and hydrogen, but if you see what happened in Europe and in other countries now, as we have more and more renewable systems into our energy um, infrastructure and renewable system mainly mean, not only means offshore parks, which are large scale and really expensive, it means a lot of photovoltaics, it means battery storages, it means uh, electrical vehicles and so on and so forth. So if this is the new future of our energy system, then someone and somehow you need to connect the dots, even if hydrogen kicks in in 10 or 15 years as a commercial viable technology. And I believe since 2016, 16, and we invest since 2016 in software technologies, which connect the dots, which mainly means that you need to connect, for example, power with your electric vehicle with the, with the battery storage of nitrogen and, and maybe my full PV in, in future. And we need then to organize a new energy system, also new, new commercial ways operating. What we already see in Germany, more and more customers, they are not asking for um, utility or electron contract with the utility. They're looking for software technologies so that they can use and commercialize their energy they already produce themselves um, uh, via, via using photovoltaic and so on and so forth. So we see a huge convergence also of the energy system into, into other infrastructures. So think about the building which is producing with the PP energy, which is having a turbine and producing energy, and then you uh, storing this energy for times of peak use. Um, and think, uh, think about many of that buildings and cars and so on and so forth. So you will have multiple points of energy storage where you can store or can use, take out energy from. So we see a totally different um, um, energy system evolving already today with a lot of heat pumps, battery storage, electric vehicles, all the hardware, which is already there, the technology we invented 20 years ago. And we um, believe using software and software technologies will 
make the best and most efficient use of already existing hardware technologies, renewable technologies, to, to, to go the first uh, steps into a net zero uh, future of energy until other technologies will be ready for, for, for being used, like hydrogen fuel cells and so on and so forth. And just fun further notion. So we invest mainly in software technologies, but I think hydrogen is such is a so exciting topic. Uh, and Nigel is much, much more in it um, than I am, but what I uh, see now, it feels like that's the new offshore, wind offshore uh, discussion we had, uh, I think 15 years ago when it started with the first parks and so on and so forth. It, it sounds like really a, a topic which, which uh, creates traction and will accelerate. But so far, my argument is let's focus on software technologies and hardware technologies we have at hand. And with that, we can create immense impact with regard to emissions reductions. And, and that's my statement and our, our focus as a firm. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I mean, clearly, from the, the discussion that we've had, just in terms of mapping out the current state of play in the landscape, um, there is a lot of innovation going on. There's a lot of investment going on. I think, Stefano, you made the point that actually some of these things are going to take 10 to 20 years before they really make that impact. So moving on to think about um, picking some of that, what is the future going to look like in terms of the near term and the longer term future state? So with that in mind, I'm going to now hand over to Russ, who's going to really unpick some of these nitty gritty issues with, with you guys. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, Parvis. Thanks for, for uh, getting us started and, and, and painting a picture, if you will, um, especially for those of us who are not in, in the weeds on, on energy transition. Really, really helpful. Um, as Parvis said, I want to start to go into a little bit more detail here and really start to focus on the applications that are emerging with respect to hydrogen fuel cells and, and energy storage. And we're, we're going to come back to each of our, our three speakers. So, Nigel, I want to come to you first. Um, and it was interesting because in the first panel, you, you, you said, and I agree with, that we must use the technologies that we have because much of this is still yet to come. Yet it would be good to get your perspective on hydrogen, on fuel cells, on energy storage, in terms of the advantages and disadvantages of each, and what does that time horizon look like? And if there are technologies that we need to use now, while we wait for those to mature and develop, um, what what technology should we be focusing on? So, kind of a couple couple questions for you here. All right. Well, look, I'll do my best in a relatively short time, right? Sure. Because a break a broad broad range of topics i mean i think the first thing to say is that you know th th there's nothing science fiction about hydrogen or, or batteries or fuel cells right you they, they exist um the physics and the chemistry is worked out um what what they're not the, but that said the only one of those technologies that's manufactured at a global scale today is the lithium-ion battery that we you know we've you're familiar with in your phones and laptops but now increasingly in electric and, and hybrid vehicles so I think the first thing to say is that, and we've you know we've seen the investments in that space significantly drive down the cost of that technology. So all of these technologies we're going to refer to here um, would benefit. You know, there's room for improvement. Don't get me wrong, but they but they do exist, right? Um, uh, but what they don't have yet, in many in in all cases, is a global supply chain. So that that's something to have in mind, other than the lithium ion battery. Um, in terms of where these technologies find out, or, or if we're talking about hydrogen, we're talking about fuel cells, we're talking about storage. Um, I think the first thing is perhaps just to, to look at each of those because they they are they are sometimes synergistic, but they're also uh, sometimes independent, and there isn't a kind of a place for them to work. The first thing let's talk about hydrogen. It's been mentioned. Hydrogen is a is a low to zero carbon energy carrier. That, that's what it is. It's a fuel. Uh, it's a molecule. Uh, and as such, it can play a role in that context. Um, firstly, though, we need to remember that we know, unlike fossil fuels, we can't go and mine or dig up hydrogen. Um, we have to use energy to produce hydrogen because we have to unbind, unbind it from things like H2O, which is water, or CH4, which is methane and natural gas. So, so the carbon credit, if you like, the environmental benefit of hydrogen does depend on how we've made it and what we've made it from. And we talk about green hydrogen, which is hydrogen made from water electrolysis using renewable power, which has a very low carbon intensity. We talk about blue hydrogen, which is hydrogen made from fossil fuels like natural gas with carbon capture, 
which is not zero carbon, but it is low carbon. Uh, and so both of those, so that, that, that from an environmental perspective, um, both of those are better than the hydrogen we make today, which has no carbon abatement in it and is largely made from natural gas. Um, but nonetheless, you can, you know, you can, we can have a, a separate conversation probably for an hour alone on just the differences between green and blue hydrogen. Personally, I think both have merits uh, in different ways. But hydrogen then is a, is a fuel, it's a low carbon gas, as, as, as has been mentioned, uh, and, and it can be used for a wide range of applications. It can be used as a transport fuel for things like buses and trucks, perhaps ships, perhaps planes. Um, it can be used as a source of heat. Um, it can be used as a source of power if it's put into a fuel cell with very high efficiency and essentially no emissions, or with low emissions if it goes into something like a gas turbine. Um, so, so that that that's hydrogen is a system enabler, right? We can um, we can talk about uh, the relative merits, but I should also be clear. And I am a hydrogen. I work in hydrogen, but if we can use electrons as electrons, that's what we should do. Uh, if we can't use the electrons locally, we can think about producing a chemical molecule like hydrogen from them and then using that. And if we can't use the hydrogen, then we might think about converting it into a synthetic liquid fuel. But there is a kind of hierarchy which we may want to explore if, if time allows. When it comes to fuel cells, a fuel cell is nothing to do with a fuel. It's an energy conversion device. It's like an engine. It takes a fuel and it produces power. The characteristics of a fuel cell is it's the most efficient way to make electricity that we know of. Uh, and, and it has a characteristic that it does this at a whole range of scales. So it can have a small engine, a small fuel cell, is almost as efficient as a large one. Whereas heat engines like internal combustion engines and gas turbines generally get less efficient as they get smaller. So that allows it to be played into a whole range of different applications, but fuel cells are very clean, very efficient energy conversion devices. So for things like buses, cars, or power generation, that's where we might want to think about fuel cells. And then storage, well, storage is a system enabler. Energy storage has no benefit other than helping a system work properly. Um, so obviously batteries and electric cars, is, is, is the function is quite obvious. But if we start to talk about low carbon grids and we have these high penetration of renewables into those grids, we have more difficulty in balancing on a second by second, minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day basis, the flow of electricity uh, in terms of supply and demand. And this is where technologies like storage come in because they allow us to make the system stable uh, it means that we're going to need different types of storage, um, some that balance it on a very short time scale, some that balance it a few hours, some that balance overnight solar, for example, diurnal storage, and some that give us a more strategic storage that allow us to um, de-risk uh, you know, uh, storage uh, over the course of days or weeks. Um, if, for example, in the UK context, we have large amounts of offshore wind and we need to think about how we balance the the, the generally low peak point we get in wind demand, wind, um, wind generation in the winter and how, we, and how we provide heat for that. So these are all technologies that are, that are flexible, they're efficient, but are not yet produced on a global scale other than the lithium ion battery and therefore have opportunities for cost down as associated with that, as well as opportunities for innovation to improve their functional performance. So it's a long answer, but it was a fairly broad question. I know it was, thank you for that. And it was really, really helpful. Maybe if I could just have a quick follow-up and go something a little bit specifically on, because I know it's on quite a few people's minds as we look at solar, as we look at wind, there are a lot of peaks and troughs and you alluded to that in your comment about energy storage. How do you see that improving over time? Is the energy story, storage technology moving fast enough uh, to enable us to manage through those peaks and troughs as renewables like solar and wind become a greater portion of our energy usage? So as an engineer, uh, the answer is yes, we have solutions that can do that. Um, I'm absolutely confident about that. Some of those solutions are nascent and are you know, being taken forward by smaller companies uh, or being developed in, in the technology labs of, of larger companies. Um, but that's more around bringing down cost, um, managing uh, the availability of critical materials, that it is, if you feel like, the fundamental physics and chemistry of the system. Um, I mean, I'm involved in several uh, companies uh, involved in 
trying to do that. So the answer is yes. However, let's not forget that these are still technologies on the whole made in relatively low volume. And so they don't attract the economy of scale that you get. And therefore their price points are, uh, are higher than we would like in many cases. <clears throat> there is a market challenge in how do you enable technologies to be scaled um, when there isn't a market for those technologies today. And yet the system is likely to need them in the future because we haven't built energy systems that need all of this storage in it um, because we haven't needed it. And yet we, we know we'll need something like it in the future. I think we also need to be fair and say there are other continued contributions to balancing systems around supply uh, on the demand side uh, and on the flexible generation side. So storage is a, an important enabler, but not the only part of the system that we need to work. And it brings in these digital uh, solutions that Jan mentioned as well, for example. Great, thank you for that, very helpful. Jan, let me come to you kind of following up from Nigel here on this question about applications. I know in the first panel, you talked about your focus on software solutions. Um, it'd be great if you can share with us a few more of those applications that you're seeing and maybe respond a little bit to what you've just heard from Nigel discuss about how the technology is evolving in, the air, in these areas and what excites you from a funding and investment point of view. Yeah, yeah, a long question. I try to, to, to be quick and, and, and um, cover all aspects. But in generally speaking, I think there, there are a lot of solutions in the software space which are helping to um, the grid systems to, to stabilize them in, in times where are oversupply of um, renewable technologies. For example, we um, invest in technologies like software technologies, which helps electrical car owners uh, to buy um, at, at lower price points energy or at price points where CO2 emissions are very low. To, to buy their energy for their cars and then driving, I would say, renewable uh, their cars. And then other, on the other hand, they also um, allow the cars to provide the energy to the energy system when energy is needed. I mean, and, and, and this technology is already working, commercial viables used by a lot of utility companies uh, overall in Europe and it's scaling right now. We are focusing on such technologies, uh, especially where we see the, the option to scale the technologies Quite, uh, quite fast uh, into the system. And with, with such a solution, you could achieve a lot. You can't stabilize the entire, entire um, energy system with that, but it's just a small first uh, step you could do. We see other startups which are focusing on topics like um, um, providing an autark um, energy solution to, for homes. Think about a photovoltaic on the rooftop, think about battery technologies um, in the basement and think about a, a little electrolyzer, which is converting all the rest into hydrogen, which you can then use in times where there is no wind, no sun uh, for, your, for your home. And that could make your home already 80% autark. That's maybe not a solution for, for, for everyone, but at least it is the first solution, which, which is somehow economically viable. And the return investment of such solutions are already in the tens to 15 years or so. So it's, it's somehow for a certain customer group affordable um, as such. So um, we are also investing into any kind of software solution and we did not cover the aspect here, which is saving the energy or the emissions of the building with normal, normal digital technologies, no deep technology, no new technology, just normal software technologies. We already can reduce the energy consumption of buildings, homes by 20 person. It's also true for, for emissions and so on and so forth. And then just the uh, uh, last um, aspect from my side and, and Russ and I, we have been part of a discussion last week. If you think about how to use the technology we, we already have at hand in an emergent markets. So today we are focusing really how to uh, become net zero in Germany, how to become net zero in, in Europe and so on and so forth. But think about using all these technologies we have available in countries where CO2 emissions are much higher, or going, going to other countries where diesel generators are currently the state of art energy production. So um, because CO2 emissions don't know any border. So if we also focus our attention in in, in reducing emissions with current technologies in other countries where it's mo much more needed, it could also create a huge impact for all of us already today. 
Thanks, John. Really helpful. And yeah, we had a great discussion last week on, on emerging markets and, and how we work with them as well. Now, I'm going to come to Stefano, but before I do, just a reminder to everybody who's watching, um, after I finish this panel session, uh, Rosario is going to come on and do some Q&A with the speakers and panelists. So please feel free to put some questions in the chat um, that we can ask the, the three panelists. So Stefano, let me come to you. Um, you touched on this a little bit in the first panel, but I'd love you to go and explore a bit more on the energy companies, the energy incumbents, as we think about this question of application. And realistically, how innovative do you think the energy uh, incumbents can be? And what kind of timeframes do you think they're looking at in terms of the applications of some of these uh, uh, technologies that we've been discussing? Thank you, Ras. So yeah, I mean, utilities uh, and, and energy companies can be innovative. We we all they take us all the time to 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 visit their their labs, their science labs, and their innovation. But I think the the key thing here to go back to what Professor Brandon was saying is, best in class utilities can adapt fast, and they can play a very important role in scaling up and in the creating that uh, global value chain. In the case of hydrogen, of hydrogen, but in other in other areas as well. So when it comes to what is the time frame they look at, um, I mean, typically uh, we when we when we think about hydrogen uh, utilities, whether they are involved in hydrogen through renewables or through grids, uh, they look at five to fifteen years to get uh, to a level where it's something material, is something that we start seeing significantly contributing to their to their numbers. I think that uh, just to bring a couple of anecdotes, personal anecdotes, I started looking at uh, uh, hydrogen very recently, 2019, because one of the companies I do research on, which is SNAM gas grid operator in, uh, uh, in, in Italy, started becoming very vocal about the role of hydrogen in the energy transition. That was 2019. Uh, the initial reaction, both from my clients as in investors and uh, other integrated utilities was of uh, generalized skepticism. Uh, it took uh, less than a year for integrated utilities, and it was 2020, to start their own hydrogen divisions. So in less than a year, every single integrated utility that, that, that I cover, starting having a hydrogen division, projects around electrolyzers, combining electrolyzers, and, uh, and their renewable efforts, um, and, and on the side of the grids, taking part on this European hydrogen backbone concept. And I think here, the point I'm trying to make is that what is important is that I think that the global value chain in hydrogen that is developing, developing and the incumbent utilities have their interests aligned. There is an alignment of interest here that is gonna play in favor of the sector developing. Where do we see the alignment? We see it in, uh, for green hydrogen in renewable generation. Uh, I mean, ultimately green hydrogen is just another source of demand for renewable capacity. Um, think about Repower EU, the document that the European Union published on the 8th of March that added on top of the 600 gigawatt of capacity that Fit for 55 was requesting for 2030, they added 80 gigawatt on top of that dedicated to hydrogen production. So interests are, al are aligned. Uh, think about also in terms of gas grids, Repower EU is basically opening to the idea of building new gas interconnection to further diversify uh, sources, but puts a condition, the new grids need to be hydrogen ready. And I mean, gas grid operators have been very vocal in asking for hydrogen to be for a blending, for a EU blending target of hydrogen into their current uh, natural gas networks. And that if, and the day it happens, will scale up demands for electrolyzers and eventually bring down the cost of green hydrogen. We know that 60% of that comes from the energy cost. The second highest driver of that cost is the electrolyzers. So we need uh, scaling up of, uh, of, of that demand and the utilities can play a role in that. Thank you for that. Just a quick follow-up before I hand back to Rosario, when we talk about the energy incumbents. From where you sit and you have a global view of things, are there any particular energy incumbents that you think are leading the pack, if you will, in terms of their focus, 
their their determination to really make these uh, changes happen more quickly. I mean, we're lumping them as one group, but we all know they're all different in terms of how they're able to get things done. I'd just be curious to get your perspective on that. I, I'm a bit biased because I follow European utilities. I've, of course, sure. I follow also the, also outside Europe, but I'm responsible for the European utilities team. And so what I can say is when you look at the largest developers globally, they are European. So probably from that point of view, Europe probably is a bit more, uh, it started a bit earlier in that phase. Uh, within Europe, I think we have some names like Iberdrola, Enel, EDP, so Southern Europe, which are the names that are today showing the fastest improvement in, in terms of uh, uh, additional capacity. And also those are the names that uh, uh, are, are embracing the concept of hydrogen fast, fast as well. Wow, that's really interesting. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have suspected that, but that's, that's very interesting to hear. So thank you for that. Great, thank you very much for, the, for joining the second panel session, Rosario. Mm -hmm. Let me hand back over to you um, to field a couple of questions um, from the uh, viewing audience. Thank you very much, uh, Russ, and thank you to the speakers and uh, to Parvez. Uh, I think uh, everybody brought lots of uh, insight, and this is really one of the things that we want to achieve uh, from this kind of events to really bring to our community that kind of awareness that is not so developed, even in professionals in technology. Uh, I, uh, I do have my question, but obviously I would like to uh, give precedence to uh, our audience. So I would really welcome any of our uh, attendees to ask any question to either one of all the speakers. Is there anyone who's ready to come forward? Because at the moment I can't see. So, well, I would say I'm happy to, to go first. Uh, maybe that can start more discussions. Uh, it's probably something that is based on my own perspective. I, I do tend to work with, uh, uh, with startups and to match them with uh, corporates. So when uh, Professor Brandon was talking about uh, nascent technologies in startups or tech labs of uh, large companies, uh, I'd like to get the perspective of, both, of actually each of the speakers starting from uh, Professor Brandon to see what kind of uh, challenges or opportunities they see, you see, uh, uh, in this kind of collaboration. Because sometimes startups are a bit more daring in venturing in new territories, but this, the incumbents are those who've got the supply chains and the uh, scope for making that innovation really flourish. So can you give us a bit of uh, perspective on your experience in this specific domain of uh, energy transition? Sure. I mean, so, Yes, I mean, I've, I've worked in large corporates myself, right? And I've worked in an academic environment and I've founded um, several businesses, including a couple recently. Um, and in fact, uh, yeah, and we should have a chat sometimes because one of the companies I'm working with is working on a smart tank for hydrogen storage for domestic settings at the moment. So um, we should have a chat about that. Um, but uh, in, in, in terms of a more sort of general uh, response to the question, um, so, you know, when, when you're at the uh, startup end of things, right, the innovator end of things, um, then it's all about having something that is potentially transformative. I mean, particularly if we're going into deep tech type investments um, or anything with the materials content, which we can put digital, I think, into a slightly separate innovation pot um, because actually the speed of innovation there, I think, is quite different than if you're a, in, a, in a kind of engineering or materials rich space, which for lots of energy technologies you are. Um, uh, and unless something really is a big step change, it's, it's not going to move the dial. Um, it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of money to do that. Um, it's pretty hard to envisage the, the, the vast majority of startups, therefore, are not going to get to the end of that journey on their own. They're going to need to innovate. Um, they're going to need to, uh, if you like, de-risk. But then they're going to need to uh, either work in it. In, they're either going to be, need, need to be sold and bought, which is a perfectly valid exit, for that in that, that particular entity, or they're going to need to form um, licenses or JVs and all, all, all these other types of commercial arrangements that give them access to um, the manufacturing know-how, the product development know-how, the systems know-how um, that are just going to be too expensive and too difficult and too slow for them to create themselves. So that partnership is absolutely vital. If I can just talk about my own experience, uh, 
you know, I set a company, I was involved, one of the founders of a fuel cell company called Sarius Power, that, that's motoring quite well now. But it's motoring quite well because it's got partnerships with Bosch, partnerships with Wei Chai, partnerships with Doosan, right? And, and, and that's how it's really motoring. Um, I have another st- uh, company that's a bit more established, not as established as that, but, it, but which is called RFC Power. It's a flow battery business um, and has just gone into the Shell Game Changer program. So that's a sort of 10, 8 to 10 hour storage technology, which is, we think, a lot cheaper than the incumbents. So again, you know, you need to find partners um, who can ultimately help, help you take it through. Um, so it, it, that partnership is absolutely critical um, in most in, in, in technologies which have this deep tech element to them. Um, as I say, I think digital is different, um, but and not my area. But uh, I do think you have because it, it, it takes such a lot of time and capital. And if you're going to move at speed, you have to be prepared to, to share that um, journey with, with, a, with a larger player. That's a really, really uh, fundamental. I, I, I really warm up to that. To that. Uh, just, uh, um, uh, Jan, could you, because I've got a question from the audience, but I'd like to hear your perspective for a, uh, for a quick uh, consideration. Would you like to integrate what uh, Professor Brandon just said to, about this? You're on mute, <laughs> Jan. Yeah, that's, that will be an ongoing topic today. No, uh, I agree to everything what Nigel um, said uh, with regard to this topic. Um, with regard to digital, it's, it, in fact, it's different. So we are focusing our, our investments into Series A and B uh, startups. Um, you, you may be aware of that companies which already have a million euros of revenues, 10 to 15 employees, mostly not deep technology, uh, hardware or software. Um, and, and this is really helpful for, for utilities to onboard their technologies in, in, in their businesses because it's somehow proven. So the technology is proven, the product is somehow proven, and that makes it quite, or it makes it much easier to onboard a new technology in a larger organization and help to scale it faster and quicker. And usually what we also like to see or what we see in our system, if we create somehow competition, so working different partners or different utilities, what also Nigel mentioned, if you have different partners in different areas, for example, one in North America, one in Europe, one um, in Asia, that makes it also more exciting for the startups to scale, but also for the utilities to work with the startups. So you can then learn from each other. So what did you learn applying this uh, solution in your country or your location and the other way around? By the way, we created an, an, an energy accelerator for doing that. It's called Free Electrons for seven utilities from different locations in the world, which really helped us to scale the technology much faster. However, I would say if we wanted to scale, and we are focusing more on business problems of today or tomorrow, if you wanted to scale in that area, you should have a, a solution at hand which can be scaled. So you need to somehow need a proven technology and, and, and some product market fit uh, for today or tomorrow. Um, otherwise, you can't scale. And I think um, coming back to, to the first, first remark of Nigel, the problem which we have today is we need, we have 10, we have, to, we have a dec- decade or so to solve the main part of the problem, isn't it? So we are really focusing on that, that part of the problem, trying to write digital solutions which de- decarbonize the system in the here and now. So that's just this perspective um, of, of the topic we discussed today. That's great. Thanks, uh, Jan. I think you just introduced uh, the concept really of uh, competition besides partnership, but also collaboration uh, across different utilities and different uh, startups. Introducing a new uh, element of uh, management and business uh, uh, concepts. Uh, Astrid was asking about uh, what would be, in your opinion, the three top challenges in terms of leadership in this space? So we've been talking about technology very much. We've been now touching on partnership and competition as business concepts, but what about leadership? Anyone wants to go first? Maybe Stefano, because you've been silent so far, or uh, anybody who's got uh, really chomping at the bit to... (laughs) Well, I mean, I I think that, uh, again, from my perspective, that is the one of a a research channel that uh, that focuses on... uh, uh, utilities and and mostly large large corporations so large integrated utilities i think what you need to do to have in leadership first in order to have leadership is is regulation regulation needs to be supportive and i was recently at a at a conference in brussels about 
uh, hydrogen networks. And uh, I mean, you realize that the European, the first bit of the European hydrogen network backbone is, is ready to start in 2024, but we still don't know what exactly will be the timing for the regulation that will surround that. So um, utilities that are present in countries which, which have a clear regulatory framework and will come uh, fast enough in terms of regulatory framework will, will definitely have an advantage. Uh, in the specific case of hydrogen and the, and the, and the kind of uh, uh, application for, for, for renewables, clearly those utilities that have started earlier in terms of uh, renewable, and today they have a very big uh, significant pipeline of projects uh, size of the pipeline of projects in our world is becoming very important and will definitely put at uh, uh, European util utilities with a sizable part pipeline at, uh, at an advantage compared to, to compared to competitors. And the last one is, is vision. I think here we, uh, in order to be leaders, uh, probably we need to, uh, to see companies forgetting a little bit about when uh, it will materially impact their earnings. We said in the beginning, most of these companies are looking at five to 10 years in order to have uh, whatever is called hydrogen playing a significant role in their revenue mix. Well, they will need to be patient enough to wait for the five to 10 years and those probably will be the leaders. I think you are on mute. Uh... I'll contribute my dollar in the, in the pot for those who <laughs> are. Uh, uh, Nigel, if I can uh, keep you on hold for a second, uh, I'd like to, to really uh, hear from Jan because uh, when it comes to leadership, investors can really play a big role in supporting investments from corporates. Uh, uh, so I saw you already quite excited about this question. So please let us uh, have your view on the question from Astrid. Thanks, Nigel, for, for, for letting me go first. Um, and I think that's the most exciting topic. If you think about what's happening in climate change, it's human produced greenhouse emissions, isn't it? So it was us uh, creating the problem, and I think it's also to be, uh, it's us, we, we are the solution, uh, or part of the solution, or the main part of the solution of solving the problem. Um, there are a lot of technologies, but if we are not changing and not behaving, we're not changing our demand, um, our way of living, like using electric cars, uh, losing more renewable power, and so on and so forth, nothing will happen. So I think it's Leadership starts with which each and everyone here in the call with all of us as a human being and taking responsibility for what happened and, and starting now to act quickly and fast. Um, and then um, I'm, I'm, I'm mindfully not going into this corporate roles of corporate organization. I think it starts with us and all of us, we have a role in, in, our, in our professions and we need to lead that um, uh, in our areas of responsibilities. Our, and I agree with you, Pavis. If I look at my kids, they are now in this uh, in this uh, student um, age. So they really um, they are they speak up already. They already make their calls. And and what we owe to them is to uh, to to bring our house in order, to uh, to leave a planet which is in a better shape than it was before. So I think, in generally, it's first of all a human task from of each and everyone from us here in the group. To make sure that we lead this properly, and and if we start, everything will follow. Large corporations, startups, uh, schools, whatever. So that's my personal remark to that. It's really refreshing to hear that from uh, investors because it br brings back to really the essential dimension. Uh, Nigel, if you allow me, because time is of the essence, I will just uh, give a very very quick run through of the key concept, and then I'll have you to wrap up the uh, uh, the event with your considerations. So. Uh, well, uh, we've heard that uh, uh, better is probably better than best, and the systems have to work together. That uh, utility companies are demonstrating quite a strong dynamism uh, opposed to, to, to uh, conventional wisdom. And that uh, that transition infrastructure that is already in place uh, is really uh, supported by software solutions, really uh, Jan's contribution. Uh, we have identified and emphasized the concept of partnership, competition, and, and, and leadership for the energy transition, and that uh, personal choices and uh, actions are really what is going to uh, make a difference. So, Nigel, from the point of view, 
of, yes, the question that we've got from the audience, but also from the point of view of science and research. Please give us your, uh, your final insight. Well, I don't know if it's a final insight, but I'll, I'll make a comment perhaps from the perspective of, 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 it, of, it, of an innovator or those people on this call who are seeking to innovate and bring their own technologies forward. I, I perhaps give them some three comments on leadership, right? One is um, uh, you, leadership is about uh, picking, picking good people and empowering them. And I think that's, that's a really important. So from the, from the perspective of, of building a business, I think that's uh, one thing to say. I think it's about persistence uh, because this is a long and hard road. Um, and it's about leaving your ego behind because um, one thing you can say in this area is that things change quickly. And that means roles of leaders and roles of people in organizations change quickly. And um, one needs to be flexible to that. And occasionally that can bruise one's ego. But I'll leave it there. Well, I think it's a, it's a fantastic way to, to wrap it up because we've been talking about personal rela uh, responsibility, but then has to be mediated by the ability to go beyond own's ego. Uh, so really, I think uh, I mean, we would love to be <laughs> on this call for much longer. There are so many other uh, topics we just uh, touched on uh, really uh, at the very uh, top level. Uh, and uh, uh, this is why I'd like to really again thank you, give a big thank you to uh, the moderators, the speakers, uh, the, the audience, and I really hope that there can be a follow-up in terms of uh, uh, each of you joining potentially our network. So we will be in touch, uh, obviously, with the recording, with a little write-up, with all uh, the main uh, concepts that have been uh, discussed. And uh, obviously, we'll be in touch as uh, Tech London advocates and Global Tech advocates to uh, really offer anyone who wants to join this uh, uh, network of volunteers to really push the cause of technology for, uh, uh, for a uh, <coughs> common good. Russ, anything you'd like to add to that? Well, the only thing I'd like to add is just to say thank you to you, Rosario, for organizing all of us. Um, for the viewers watching, there have been a number of uh, pre-meets before this discussion in terms of working through the agenda, the questions. And Rosario, I know you put a lot of time and effort into organizing all of this. So in addition to all of the speakers and moderators, um, thank you to you for your great leadership and for driving the, uh, the Circular Economy Working Group. Really pleased to have you doing this. Well, you made my day. That's actually encouragement for bigger and better things. So <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> see you see you hopefully very soon and hopefully also in person so thank you very much again for your time today and uh, look forward to bigger and better things for net zero thank you thank Have you a lovely evening thank you all <laughs> okay.